Over the years, we've covered different topics around copy protection, DRM, anti-piracy measures, and how each were ultimately defeated. The battle between the software publishers and the crackers have long raged on, perhaps even longer than one may consider. So far on the channel, our earliest discussions around copy protection go all the way back to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum and the lens lock protection, a crude method that descrambles a code by looking through a small glass prism with lines. We covered this on the channel in recent times and it's worth a look if you're interested in learning more. But lens lock enabled games were available around 1985. In this episode, we are going to go back to the dawn of home computers and video games and talk about one of the earliest known protection methods that was discovered in a video game. In 1979, although Microsoft wasn't the giant that they are known as now, Bill Gates was firmly setting the stage. With Microsoft Basic already licensed by Apple, IBM, Tandy and Commodore in their respective machines. And Microsoft would be interested in making games, so they established the Microsoft Consumer Products Division. While not something that had any long-term success, the division was responsible for contracting Bruce Artwick to create the first Microsoft Flight Simulator game. Near the end of 1979, Microsoft Consumer Products Division would release Microsoft Adventure, initially for the Tandy TRS-80 home computer, and later on, ports to the IBM PC and Apple II. Microsoft Adventure is a text-based adventure game that is a port of Colossal Cave Adventure, which was originally developed by William Crowther and Don Woods. Colossal Cave released in 1976, and it's a text-based adventure game that sets the player to explore a cave full of treasures with the goal to earn the most number of treasures and survive. In 1977, Don Woods would expand the game, and the original Colossal Cave Adventure released on the DEC PDP-10 mainframe, and it's considered the first ever adventure game. The game itself is known as a work of interactive fiction that uses text to tell the story. The game parser accepts two words commands, such as get lamp, go south, or enter cave. The game describes in text the player's location and the responses to the actions that they have taken. Microsoft Adventure then would be the first complete home port of Colossal Cave, the entire mainframe release running on a home computer, the Tandy TRS-80. This would be a very big deal at the time because in the same way as home ports of arcade games later on, a mainframe game running on a home computer with just 32 kilobytes of RAM would not be trivial. The original game ran in Fortran and was ported to Z80 assembly. And the man behind the port would be Gordon Letwin. Letwin would let Microsoft know that he was more than capable of porting Colossal Cave Adventure to the Tandy TRS-80. Attempting to fit the entire game in RAM would not be an option. So Letwin would take advantage of the floppy disk drive in the TRS-80 to only load parts of the game as needed essentially streaming in data as required and using it effectively as virtual memory. This method, while certainly not patented, would be used in many games that came later on. As a result, the game released exclusively on a single 5 quarter inch floppy disk, which was unique at the time because many home computers also supported the cheaper tape drive, but there would be no way that Microsoft Adventure would be possible on cassette. It simply required fast random access. Exclusive to floppy disk also meant that Microsoft Adventure could easily be duplicated with a disk copying program. And Microsoft knew that copied disks of the game could hurt their revenue. So Microsoft and Letwin would come up with perhaps one of the first ever known copy protection methods, which attracted enough media attention at the time with Byte Magazine labeling it a nightmare for the software pirate. The game disk simply would not be able to be copied via conventional methods. And to understand why, let's first take a quick primer on how floppy disks work. A floppy disk contains magnetic media which is capable of storing computer binary data of ones and zeros. Imagine storing some data on the disk, let's say a few hundred bytes, and then trying to access it. Where does it even exist? A typical floppy disk contains concentric rings or tracks that are numbered in sequential order. The number of tracks will vary depending on the size and density of the disk. In this example on the Tandy TRS-80 Model 1, a five and a quarter inch disk will contain 35 tracks where track zero represents the outermost track and track 34 
would be the innermost. Because discs are double-sided, the same applies for the other side of the disc. Each track is also split into sectors. Using our example again, a standard TRS-80 Model 1 contains 10 sectors per track. It's this organization of tracks and sectors that allows for fast random access of data. Rather than starting from track 0 and reading sequentially, if the operating system knows where to find its data, it can simply seek to that particular track and sector and access it. A standard TRS-80 floppy disk contains 35 tracks and 10 sectors per track, with track 0 containing the bootloader, a small program that will simply auto-boot into the game and set up whatever variables that it needs. But Microsoft Adventure for the TRS-80 does not follow this disk scheme at all. In fact, when trying to make a duplicate of the disk, it appears to be corrupted. So what's actually going on here? Well, as it turns out, when a disk is formatted, each track and sector is numbered from 0 to 34, like we said previously. However, Microsoft Adventure does not follow this numbering scheme at all. Instead, track 1 is actually track 127, and track 2 is track 125, and each track decreases by 2 until the disc hits the 34th track, which in turn ends up being track 61. The only track that is not altered is track 0, because the system still must process its bootloader and load into the game. What's actually occurring here is Microsoft Adventure would renumber the tracks in an attempt to thwart disc copying, and it worked. But how does an original game handle the track misnumbering? The Track Zero bootloader also contains a patch to tell the TRS-80 disc routine how to access the non-standard track numbers, and the game simply boots. This would be a very simple yet effective copy protection measure, especially in 1979. Attempting to make a copy of the game proved very difficult, with many popular copy programs at the time simply failing. The challenge then would be how to circumvent it. It would be difficult, but not impossible. Way before any cracking groups or scene existed, in 1979, Australian-born Nick Andrews was playing Colossus Cave on deck mainframes at Deakin University. He was a fan of the game and spent many hours playing it on the university mainframes. At home, he had a TRS-80 and got a hold of a copy of Microsoft Adventure one year for Christmas. He tried to make a backup of the game and failed because he loved the game so much and never wanted to lose the original. So he would then spend the next two or three days learning the copy protection mechanism so he could make a copy of the disc. According to Nick's blog about how he defeated the copy protection, he would confirm the alternative track numbering. His method to copy the disc then was to simply write a disc format program that would apply these track numbers instead of the normal 0123 sequence. With the unique formatted disc, he would then write a custom copy tool that used those unique track numbers, effectively generating a one-to-one -one copy of the game with the protection intact, as it maintained the exact same track numbers. But this would not be the final result. Nick realized it would be easier to simply patch out the bootloader code that maps tracks to the alternative method found on the Microsoft Adventure disk, effectively allowing for the game to run on any standard copy disk and be duplicated with conventional methods. This would be one of the very first known video game cracks that would ever exist, well before the cracking scene came along in the early 80s. He would simply remove the alternative track numbering system and was done. If you were interested in learning more about this on Nick Andrews' blog page, he does go into a lot of detail about adventure and how he defeated the protection, as well as the assembly language programs for the first method that he used, essentially just formatting the disk with the changed track numbers, and then the second method, which is the more traditional cracking of the game. And I have to say, it's probably one, if not the first, official crack of any video game that came out in history. Now, there's probably other examples of this that I'm not too familiar with, but as far as I know, the crack of adventure really is the first one that at least I'm familiar with. And if anyone out there is familiar with anything different, I'd be very interested to hear more about that in the comments below because I am very 
much curious about how the cracking scene really got started in a official sense. But for me, I think this is a pretty fascinating topic to talk about the first ever video game that had anti-piracy protection in place and how it was ultimately defeated and it really did set the stage for what would come later on with all sorts of different methods and to where we are today with the more as a service approach or in the case of many games that get released you know in the first couple of weeks it will incorporate something like de novo anti-piracy for example but that is definitely another topic for another time we are going to leave it here for this episode if you liked it don't forget to leave me a thumbs up thank you for watching and i'll catch you guys in the next video Bye for now.